Here to talk with us about climate change and what we can do to improve on current use of resources is energy expert Wolfgang Sachs from the Wuppertal Institute. Now, saving energy by about 80% sounds really great, but don't we really improve just on a bad system, a system which will never truly become sustainable? Well, that is certainly a danger if we go to the extreme, uh, because after all, it is not very rational to run highly efficiently into the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. But having said that, of course, it makes a lot of sense, taking the example of the truck, to improve the efficiency of particular devices, of machines, and of cars and trucks as well. But it could actually hinder investments in the right technologies, the ones not using fossil resources. Well, I'm not so sure, because even if you think of, uh, you know, the solar future, there is no doubt whatsoever that we cannot have a solar future at the present level of energy consumption. Mm. So the first imperative is to bring down the overall energy need. And that's what the truck example shows. But the overall energy need has actually gone up in the last years, even though all of our devices, our fridges, our applications have become more efficient in the past. How come? Yeah, very right so. I mean, the most uh, outstanding example in a certain way is the car. I mean, we know that the specific efficiency of a car, which means the one, the efficiency of a single car, fuel efficiency, has increased over the last 20 years. But the problem is not solved. Why? Because we have put more cars on the road. The cars have become heavier and speedier. Mm -hmm. So the, the growth effect has eaten up mm -hmm. the efficiency. How do we solve that? That shows that specific efficiency is not enough. You have to look at the entire system. You have to discuss how many mm -hmm. cars, how heavy cars are, so what kind of speed they offer. So the, the performance level of cars has got to be um, mm -hmm. kept on an intermediate level and cannot be allowed to increase and to grow mm -hmm. at the same time. Will it maybe mean that we have to renounce a lot of things, things we've gotten used to driving in cars, using fridges and so on? Uh, well, renouncing is only one side of it. The other side is you're gaining something. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are renouncing of uh, traffic jams. We renounce uh, of commuting. Mm -hmm. uh, so many things, you can also call that renouncing. So it is a, it's a new kind of balance to look for when it comes to new burdens and new gains. Life does not necessarily have to become less comfortable. No, not at all. Only what comfort means has to be redefined in a certain way. Thanks up to here, Professor Sachs. A key argument against converting energy production from fossil fuels to renewables has been that we can't rely on them for a steady supply. The sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. In an effort to make sustainable resources a more reliable bet, a new research direction is now looking into the future. Solar and wind power plants may help reduce climate warming. They do not produce the massive amounts of CO2 that conventional fossil fuel plants do. But their electricity yield is highly variable because the sun's intensity and the wind speed change with the weather. Germany's wind energy turbines could supply 10 cities the size of Berlin with power if the wind was blowing constantly. This facility strikes the balancing point between the electricity being fed into the grid and total usage. The engineers here constantly adapt the energy generated to actual demand so as to prevent overloading the grid. They're helped by a system that predicts how much wind energy they're likely to make over the next 24 hours. The blue line shows the wind energy produced during stormy weather. It was much higher than predicted values, and it rose suddenly. You can imagine that this puts an absolute strain on the system itself, and it makes it a huge challenge to adjust for these processes. It's as if you were constantly turning entire units of a power plant on and off at short intervals. It's a big challenge. As the proportion of wind and solar power in the energy mix rises, the difficulties of balancing the power in the grid with demand have also grown. Reliable weather predictions are playing an increasingly important role. 
Researchers at the German Aerospace Center in Munich are developing those kinds of prognoses. They specialize in supply-demand predictions for solar energy plants that concentrate the sunlight and use the heat to make electricity. They are currently working on prognoses for Endosol in southeastern Spain, Europe's largest solar thermal power plant. Unlike facilities that use photovoltaic cells, these power plants convert direct sunlight into heat and then into electricity. That means anything that darkens the light has a significant effect on the plant's output. The Munich meteorologists factor in clouds, but also fine particles in the air, so-called aerosols. For their predictions, the scientists need to know precisely how much the different types of clouds and particles reduce the incoming sunlight. It's the same with both clouds and aerosols. They have very different values of what we call optical density, depending on where they're coming from. A dust particle has different properties from a soot particle, and we have to know what's actually in the air at any given moment. The satellite images are a big help. Meteosat, a European weather satellite, provides valuable data. Its images show the distribution of clouds and aerosols and how fast they are moving. The satellite provides a new picture every 15 minutes. That allows the researchers to predict irradiation levels for the upcoming hours. These pictures show a dust cloud on its way from the Sahara to southern Spain. Combining the images with other data from the satellite, the meteorologists have created a computer simulation of how the dust cloud is spreading. The different colors show how much the dust blocks the sunlight. These cabinets contain satellite pictures from the past three decades. They're a treasure trove of information from the energy meteorologists. Using the images, they can reconstruct how much sunlight reached the Earth over the years. Based on that, they can see where it's worthwhile to build solar energy plants. Maps show the energy yield at the Mediterranean over the period of a year. Amounts of sunlight were highest in the yellow regions. This basic research is geared toward realizing a vision. Called Desertec, it foresees giant solar power plants that would provide Europe and Africa with climate-friendly electricity. What that means for us is that we're able to describe the aerosol aspect much more precisely because Desertec will also be focused on the North African region, and there's more dust from the Sahara there. The scientists soon hope to be able to predict energy yield up to two days into the future. That would allow wind and solar power suppliers to distribute electricity as efficiently as possible, saving money and protecting the environment as well. Joining us in the studio is still Professor Wolfgang Sachs from the Wuppertal Institute. Now, as we've just seen, the Desert Tech project is a large-scale power plant. Is that the way to actually convert our energy production into the future energy production without uh, fossil fuels? Well, it might be an element. Uh, but what I'm concerned about is that the image of Desert Tech in a way distracts attention from what has got to be the primary and most important path, that is to push for a decentralized uh, renewable energy future. Because that's the big chance which comes along with renewables, that given that water, sun, uh, 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 plants are everywhere, mm -hmm. you can have energy production everywhere. That means in many small places, scale power plants. Small scale in many places and connected through the electrical grid. And can we actually renounce completely the old fossil fuel power plants, coal, for example? Well, in the long run, yes, not in the short and in the medium term. In the medium term, meaning the next two or three decades, we will need some fossil, most likely gas and most likely uh, 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 co-generated uh, mm -hmm. electricity and heat at the same time. Just a word to Copenhagen. Can we actually afford to let the negotiations up there fail? Well, of course, it is a scandal that the US is not ready. But on the other hand, it's not in that sense a catastrophe because nothing uh, um, inhibits us to do the same thing next year. Thanks a lot for the talk, Professor Wolfgang Sachs.